welcome to our first podcast of Jet Set Learn, Aviation STEM with the Forgotten Heroes Foundation. And welcome as a co-founder of the Forgotten Heroes Foundation. We're looking to do uh, a lot of uh, inspiration, inspiring great people to do, continue to do great things and to also inspire folks to kind of discover the hero within themselves. And so today um, I'm here with Lucia Morton. I guarantee you after we go through this conversation today, you guys will see that Lucia is truly a future, uh, future hero. She's a hero right now because in the, as you guys will hear here in a second, amazing things she's already done and probably the most impressive thing so far as just the early age in which you've accomplished these things. And so what I really want to do today is just kind of get to know you and then kind of understand, you know, what, um, you know, the things that impacted you. So just looking at this, I mean, already, I'm just reading through this already, you're on your way to Purdue. So just finished up high school. But prior to mm-hmm. that, you started a business, wrote a book, <laughs> been doing multiple internships with NASA. And then it sounds like your specialty right now is um, high temperature materials, Absolutely. right? Yeah. So uh, first, just kind of going back, like, what was your, um, you know, your upbringing like? Like, were you, did you have a lot of technical influences on you to kind of get you in, into Ooh. into this kind of thing or what? That's a great question. So I have to shout out to my mom. She is um, an electrical engineer that graduated from the Coast Guard Academy. Nice. And has kind of always kind of encouraged me to stay into math and science. I already had that love um, for space since I was very, very little. I used to watch a lot of videos about, you know, outer space and all that um, and rockets. So I, um, yeah, I was definitely inspired by my mom to, to continue pursuing it. And then once I got to middle school, I finally got my first experience in like a shop environment and to get hands-on projects. And then as I moved on to high school, got to do, you know, I applied to a couple summer camps that were, were related more to towards that uh, materials engineering type stuff. But in general, yeah, I think it was definitely my mom who, <laughs> of course, gave me that you know encouragement at the, the, at the so, start. So truth be told, we were, uh, the producer and I were, before you came in, we were like, I'm pretty sure the parents were kind of really involved with this. I was like, oh, you don't know, you never uh, can't tell. Well. <laughs> and so now they kind of hear the bet is settled, <laughs> kind uh. of hear that hey, it, it, exact, it was a, 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 you know, a good, uh, experience and you know your mom was very impactful on that and I think the thing that we uh, like I see from that is just the that example of being supportive that it's it sounds like she may have been giving you a chance to kind of figure it out on your own did she push you to be an engineer or? um not necessarily so originally when I started off um, I was I've been super into the arts and I still am um, and she told me you know that's that's not where you need to go to make money I mean as a, as an immigrant mom she was raised on getting degrees in maybe finance or in being a doctor or whatever that is. Um, and I, you know, I fell in love with math and she was encouraging in that way. She mentioned that she had done this career in electrical engineering. Um, and I was more towards like this, the aerospace side. I loved, I love seeing big rockets and I love learning about astrophysics, you know, as a, as much as a middle schooler could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, she was definitely encouraging, um, but not necessarily pushing me in any one direction, which I definitely think helped me foster my own interests. Um, I never felt like I was, kind of pigeonholed into one one specific area. Yeah. It was definitely just like a, you know, do good in school and, and way to go. And um, yeah, just just encouraging me to stick with it. I think. Cool. That's, so that's you said it. your mom's an immigrant. Where, where'd she? Uh... She's from Panama. Panama. So, yeah. So my, my mom's side of the family is from, is from Panama. And it's funny, they're there right now. <laughs> oh, nice. My, my mom's, yeah, going to go see her. Uh, my whole family over there. But. Okay. Have you been to Panama? I have. I have. Yeah. My a kind of funny story. When I was uh, in fifth grade, she put me on a plane by myself for the first time to like go see my family out there. And of course, they you know they picked me up and everything. I didn't have to walk to walk to the house all by myself. Yeah. But um, definitely uh, encouraging that kind of independence <laughs> really early. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. See my family, but yeah. So you mentioned um, definitely the, the the part of about being into the arts. And mm-hmm. so kind of, again, learn a little bit about you. You wrote a book. Can you tell me a little bit about the book? Oh, and, I'd love to, yeah. yeah. Um, that That's definitely an integration of both things with the arts and the sciences. I've always loved to illustrate, but I knew that, um, you know, in high school, I wanted to start some kind of business that, that revolved around STEM education and, and just kind of getting kids more interested in maybe sustainability, because that was a big interest of mine at the time. So we, we wrote this book. Um, so the, the company's called Worldplay, and it's not, it's not just me. It's a group of five awesome students who kind of built this idea together. But we built this uh, group called Worldplay and published a book 
um, about this girl who's who's traversing through a couple different challenges. And again, it's a children's picture book, so uh, it gives the students an opportunity to kind of make their own choices. It's wow. almost a model after a choose your own adventure type story. Um, so we pulled from that that kind of children's book model and had a, a book where students could learn about, you know, sustainable choices and, and what their impact would be on their environment, kind of basing it off of the Virginia Beach region that we grew up in. Okay. But, but yeah, that was the goal. And then we took that book once we were able to get a, a little bit of funding and, and publish, um, we took it to elementary school so we could do readings and we can, you know, talk with our little <laughs> uh, our little puppet and, and, and do big readings and everything. And that was really fun. I mean, that was the real fruit of the experience yeah. was being one on one with the students. So, so kind of going back to the um, the STEM aspect. What so maybe I missed it in the book. Is there some aspect of STEM in in the book itself? Yeah, yeah. I think that just that idea of um, you know we put little fun fact cards in there about about sustainability. Maybe like um, where you know where things go in the landfill. And again, it's at a digestible level, kind of to di- dilute a lot of these big sustainability topics that we're hearing about. Um, and, and, and making it accessible to younger students. I mean, okay. this is like a you know, third grade-ish reading level. Yeah. So the, the STEM aspect there is, you know, how do we encourage kids to be interested in maybe renewable energy or, 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 or those kinds of environmental sciences? Um, so you think, would you say, is it fair to say that for you, STEM has always been a part of your life? Yeah, you know? 100%. <laughs> okay. No, I just had phenomenal. It really came from my teachers. Yeah. I, um, I went to a, a school where they were just so into going beyond the curriculum and then taking us outdoors and, you know, playing with the little little marshes around our school or or whatever that was. I mean, it was just a very immersive STEM experience, um, and that started really early, and that's just kept me engaged for forever. So. That's awesome to hear. Just, um, again, at the Forgotten Heroes Foundations, we do the STEM and aviation outreach, and mm-hmm. we put on classes, and our probably the thing that we always come back to is this project-based immersion type yeah, of thing. And so yeah. it sounds like your living proof that that approach can really do uh, be very impactful and be 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 very useful. So, with that said, it sounds like you would agree then that project based learning is uh, key. One hundred percent. And there's some really cool universities that I was really interested in looking at that do that for the bachelor's program. I mean, they'll completely involve the students in multiple product based learning courses, like Olin College and um, uh, Harvey Mudd. If you've heard of those, I mean, th- those programs, and then bring that back in high school and middle school starting kids early with the team building, um, making them design their own projects, having them kind of work through the curriculum in a way where they kind of have control over their learning. That is the most empowering thing, I yeah. think. And I, I hope to get that, you know, as I move forward, but it's definitely important early on. <laughs> but it's really awesome to, um, to to kind of hear your perspective on a lot of these things. And so from Virginia Beach mm-hmm. and uh, Kempsville? Yeah. Kempsville yeah. High School. Mm-hmm. Um and was was inside of Kimsville High School were there uh, programs that you would say were kind of lean toward that immersion type of thing? Um, well, we had our entrepreneurship and business academy, okay. and you know Virginia Beach has a couple cool programs like that where you can take specialty classes, maybe in STEM or in arts. But the the EBA there, um, the business that I was able to create was kind of. Um, done in an incubator type environment. So the class called Incubator EDU, I think they do it in other schools around the country, but um, it fosters this project based, you know, student leadership type of environment. You're working your entire year towards this like big pitch night where you're able to get funding. And the whole class is like pretty open ended where yeah. kids get to like pick a problem and, and do prototyping and then go forth with that. So the entrepreneurship, even though it wasn't STEM focused, um, they definitely gave a lot of opportunities to, to let students, you know, run their own projects. So. Yeah. Like All that. right. So early exposure, multiple opportunities to have it fostered. So now we're here uh, and you've done at least your mentor or one of your uh, mentors, you kind of mentioned to me that you've done at least one, maybe two internships at NASA. So <laughs> how, how did you get selected to do that? Oh, that's that. I mean, I think it's mostly luck. Uh, it's, really? Yeah. There's a lot of luck that came into that. Um, the, Kind of the the short story was that I um, I was originally doing this PR internship with someone who was running an offshore wind um, initiative called Wednesdays. This is a mentor, Joel Rubin and Sarah Joe Rubin, who just did such an incredible job in introducing me to like the offshore wind industry and the PR side of that. So from there, um, I was able to meet a bunch of people who worked in STEM and eventually came across someone at NASA. Um, and you know, after 
begging for, for tours and to see the <laughs> facility and just to kind of learn more about their work, I learned that as a high schooler, I was able to apply. You know, I never thought that someone in my position could even apply to be an intern over there. So I learned about the internship program. Um, I had already had some experiences in high school that were kind of related to this high temperature materials work. Um, I, you know, submitted the application and, you know, I got I got lucky to be picked for an interview. Um, and luckily in that interview, I was able to bring up these experiences at high school that um, were related to to the material side, but also I was able to kind of highlight um, the product-based learning that I got to do. So I think all that together is just it's a lot of luck um, <laughs> and in preparation for that. But I'm sure you were yeah. prepared by the time you got there. Um, oh no, I, I had so much to learn though. I mean, it was just it was every day I was being taught on the job, and I think that that's the experience for a lot of other interns too. Is that we we come in with a certain you know yeah. curriculum and background, but they teach us everything. There. So it sounded like, and one of the things I wanted to find out is like we're were you interested in the high temperature materials or was, was this just the intern that presented internship that presented itself? Ooh. You were able to kind of, it's a good question. Um, there's definitely a little bit of both, but for the most part, I mean, I, I had, um, I had applied to the summer camp in, in high school yeah, that was sorry. about just materials engineering in general. And at that summer camp, I, uh, they had a couple little tracks, um, you know, they pulled kids from all over the country just to learn about materials engineering in general at uh, Missouri s and It's a really great camp called Engineering Your World. And at this camp, there was a, you know, a, a track that had to do with high temperature materials and, and space applications, reentry applications. And I thought, there we go. There's my, there's my end. I want to learn, you know, what are the materials? What, are, what is the lingo for this industry? Um, and definitely spending some time in that helped me learn about my love for for this for this group so so you think you'll stay in the high temperature materials or you know you i kinda... i've loved my experience but um definitely i think as an undergrad it's just important to widen your skill set at the beginning yeah, I was say so that. i'm definitely planning on bouncing around some but uh absolutely planning on paying it forward to the team that's that's so uh, i, I think i remember this correctly i think you're a woman after my own heart with respect to the, your choice of engineering so you're going to go to purdue what are you going to mm -hmm. study Originally, I was picking mechanical, but now I'm just, I, I love Arrow, and I love the uh, way the Purdue structures Arrow, so that's where I'm headed now. Well, I was a mechanical, uh -huh. uh, but I love the aerospace, so I'm I knew, I I'm knew, I knew, you're, I I knew you were there, I knew yeah, you were there, yeah. it, one way or the other, yeah. I, I like that approach, and I think mechanical, I hear all the time that the mechie kids get more hands-on work than Arrow, so that's, I, that's, that's still pulling me <laughs> in that direction. I, I, truth be told, almost mm -hmm. when I was in college several years ago, mm -hmm. um, I almost changed from mechanical engineering to manufacturing engineering technology oh. for the reason of they were in the lab and yeah. they were building stuff. They were bending metal. They were like putting right. things together. I was like, that's what I want to do. Right. Like, I love, you know, books and that kind of understand it, but I want to put the hands on, which is why I became a pilot. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, awesome. and so truth be told, I had the school that I had gone to, um, had an aerospace program. Mm -hmm. I seriously would have gone aerospace so you're you're right there i knew you were a woman after my own heart and so <laughs> oh. uh hopefully uh you let me know what you what you wind up picking either no matter what you go into i'm sure you're gonna continue to just uh do some do some awesome stuff and Thank so you. so you've been exposed to the stem industry and it sounds like you have a passion for it i'm a little surprised though with the electrical that you know influence from your mom right yeah. well you know electrical um is still kind of a, a tiny yeah. little interest of mine but it's a totally different field oh yeah um, there's room for that in in aerospace, right, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, how, what do you see uh, as far as like? Um, I'm gonna ask this in two different parts. Okay. One is like the people aspect of technology development in the future. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's gonna change? Because like um, when I was going through a while ago, it was mostly men that were doing the engineering, and mm -hmm. it, you know, and I would expect it still to be kind of the same as what I see even in the aviation industry. It's, more men than women and whatnot. And um, multiple reasons as to why that could, could potentially be. But do you think, uh, what do you see the future being? Mm -hmm. uh, like, well, one, it sounded like you were encouraged to do whatever, so um, you were able to get in. But what do you think, the, the how do you see the future being uh, with respect to the people aspect of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, w I was more than fortunate to have been encouraged so much, both by, you know, coming from the household and from, from the industry. And um, I do still hear that all the time from my peers that have, been through school, they say that their classes are are predominantly maybe it's like 70 30 in terms of the ratio between men and women. But what's been really neat is that at NASA, and I think this this is likely intentional, um, I have not seen that kind of trend. I honestly I see way more 
female interns, um, at least in our in our groups, uh, just kind of taking and leading off. And again, every all the young people I've I've met are just super eager and super excited. And that's just yeah. you know a product of the of the people that come to to Langley. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that there's just a lot more respect and support for for women who are entering these fields, and um, it makes it a lot easier to have those conversations openly. Right. And I think that even with uh, you know people who are more later in their career, um, they seem to be getting more adept with, with handling those conversations, yeah. and that's been helpful too. Um, but, yeah, I guess that, that's hard to answer. Yeah, um, 100%. I, and I, it's hard for me to answer. It's, uh, part of that was a selfish reason for me asking because um, I have two daughters, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, I like to encourage them to do – you know, do whatever, um, whether it's technical or whether it's not or whatever else. And so I think the important thing for society and for us to continue to do is to, to give and provide opportunities across the board, just like you talk, talked about and the experiences, oh, yeah. there's a mutual respect throughout. And, you know, if you choose to do it, then so be it, but it shouldn't be, um, definitely shouldn't be discouraging one way or the other for whatever reason. It should just a present the opportunities and people gravitate to it. And that is a, what trends show, where you get the best uh, people and the best uh, results, and you know, in a, you know, here in the states, we start producing uh, mm-hmm. uh, top-notch technology and those kind of things just from the right people choosing and gravitating to the right, you know, the right industry, regardless of you know. So making sure that we have equal playing field, laying it out, laying the opportunities out there, and then you know, the right people for the right reasons will go to the right jobs. And that's what we get. So um, absolutely. you mentioned earlier about your mom mm-hmm. uh, and the impact. Are there other mentors in your life uh, from a technical standpoint or either currently or in the past that, you know, continue uh, to impact the way you're going? Yeah, I, I love this question because I really can accredit my my entire career so far to these mentors. Um, Vince Kuda, Greg Mikes, uh, David Glass. Brian Kubitschek, I mean, there's just so many people at Langley that have really taken me under their wing and, um, you know, in both the technical and professional sense, kind of helped me build uh, this persona in in, in this uh, field, um, you know, teaching me some some about their, their legacy and their history and some of the technologies that they've worked on, as well as kind of showing me um, the path forward as an early career person, like what resources to access, setting up my projects for the internship and kind of challenging me with, you know, when things start to slow down, giving me brand new problems and introducing me to niches in the field that I could have never picked up on on my own. And I think that that's one of the, the biggest things that a mentor can do for you is kind of introduce you to these challenges that you wouldn't have access to without their expertise and yeah. without their background information. I mean, they, they know what the challenges are now. They know what they were before, and they have a pretty good idea for what they're going to be in the future. So, um, you know, all those, those guys have been incredible um, in terms of helping me get cool. started. Do you consider yourself a mentor to anybody? Oh, I wish that I was more of a mentor. I think that, you know, I had a couple friends in high school that were a little bit younger than me that maybe in sports I was able to, you know, help give a helping hand to. But that's definitely a goal of mine when I get to undergrad is to maybe find some younger students that I can pass things down to because I know that that's a big um, – it helps build you as a person being a mentor. I mean, my mentors say that all the time, that, that been a, being a mentor for so many years has helped them. So – uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to starting that, but I don't think I've found that yet. So I'll yet. tell you what, uh, we'll give you an opportunity to come back and <laughs> oh. work and do things at oh, some of our summer programs or whatever else. If you ever want to yeah. just come in and be a guest speaker, hopefully, yeah, this this podcast uh, will inspire some people, but it's nothing like meeting people in person. Yeah. And so um, kind of going back to your high temperature materials. Um, mm-hmm. When I got to my first internship, this was Last summer, uh, they, they put me with a, a contractor of our team at Langley called Exothermics. Um, and this is like a, a much smaller company. It's private, but we were we had a collaboration with Langley. And they put me there to kind of, number one, learn about the industry and get introduced to, to these composites. But um, what I was able to pick out is that, you know, because it's a smaller lab, they don't have all the big tools that a, that a national lab might have in terms of, you know, uh, data processing or, or um, some of the analysis technologies they had. So... I was able to kind of identify a little gap in in their uh, their, their processing techniques. So they have this microscope um, that most material scientists use called the scanning electron mis- microscope or the SEM. And with those, you get uh, grayscale information about the the um, elements in a material. So based on the electrons that come back into the image, it shows you kind of like a grayscale uh, picture of, of what's going on in that material. But in this lab, they didn't really have a good way to uh, quantitatively 
pick out, you know, what are the surface area fractions of this of this image or help me quantify like what is your residual silicon in, in in this big composite. So I was able to help kind of get that started and it was my first experience really with with programming, so it was a good introduction for me also. But um, that has been kind of like one of my little little projects at the beginning was was working on some codes that help with image processing. But yeah, my, my team specifically has been enabling um, a number of, of larger flight, flight projects just in terms of helping get this, what we talked about, the low TRL technology, um, those fundamental concepts with, you know, can a composite do this or how does it, how does it behave under these thermal stresses or, um, you know, what are, the, what are the inner laminar properties because the composite is so hard to model, it's not like a metal. Um, so all the work that our team has been doing has definitely been um, promoting this material system, which then kind of helps lift up other larger flight projects because, you know, the, the, the composites are, are much more efficient than, than some of these other technologies that we've been using for a number of years. So I wouldn't say that, you know, as an as a undergrad intern, I've directly boosted a flight project, <laughs> but definitely our, our team is doing a lot of that, that kind of work. That's cool. So, yeah, that's teamwork. Fun. So that was the people aspect of it. Mm -hmm. What do you think or what would you like to see as the next leading edge technology? Ooh. Such a big question. I know. Um, it's funny. We just had an awesome conversation about this today in the future of how, you know, Langley is. We had a, a, an ex-astronaut come in um, to talk to us about, you know, the, the future of, of Langley and how we approach new technologies and how we approach, you know, the workforce, the uh, workforce development and early career people in, in developing these and how we transition from, you know, historical technologies like these legacy materials or the legacy tests or vehicles and then kind of innovate where we have space and, and working with, with what we have available. Um, so your question is more so what, what technologies we want to bring on? Or? Well, what would, like, a, a technology, leading edge uh -huh. technology that you would like to see develop yeah. and you would like to be a part of? Let's, Ooh, let's, let's put okay. it like that. It's probably an easier question. Yeah. <laughs> more along with what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to ask. Is, sure, sure. Maybe, maybe an easy answer for some of the people in the, in the hypersonics, high temperature materials mm -hmm. realm um, to talk about. Uh, you know, reusable hypersonic commercial aircraft to get people from, from one place to another a lot quicker, um, you know, to get people flying at mock speed and making that accessible um, to the common person. I think that just bringing down the costs of some of these materials that enable, uh, you know, hypersonic flight is is definitely a big goal for, um, for the people in this industry. So I'm excited to see where this goes. Um, still definitely in the weeds in terms of the fundamental yeah. um, studies on, on these. So specifically the composites that we work on, um, definitely still in the weeds there. But I'm excited to see where this goes. I mean, there's a lot of people pushing for uh, bring those low TRL materials up and up and flying. You know, that, that's their main career goal is to see them in the air rather than, you know, staying in the labs. Yeah, those low technical readiness levels yeah. kind of things. Um, so it's interesting that um, the hypersonics definitely brings – a thermal aspect mm -hmm. to it just mm -hmm. based off of the speeds and things that you're kind of going through. So that's going to be, that's, that's a really cool, uh, I'm excited too to hear about it. So before we got going and we were kind of shooting a breeze around here, you asked me this question, uh, about why don't we start bringing people out here, uh, and kind of to the foundation and doing those things. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I, what I mentioned to you is that, Hey, part of our, what we're charged to do as part of our outreach is to incentivize and to inspire and to look at people that have done the great things and also to reward and incentivize. So what I want to do is offer you a flight in our L-39 Albatross. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's a tactical jet trainer that was uh, raced at Reno. So it used to be one of the fastest airplanes on the uh, fastest uh, L39 uh, oh, wow. on the face. But we've done some things where we tune the motor back and, it, you know, it's it's basically a stock L39, but it's a kick in the pants. And mm -hmm. uh, if you want to, I'd love to reward you for that and kind of hope they oh inspire you to <laughs> hypersonics, high speed, wow. and all those kind of things. <laughs> oh, that, that would be such a gift. Thank awesome. You, thanks. Thank you for having me here today, really. Yeah. My, my mentor has a funny saying. He'll be like, I, I won't get out of the out of bed for under Mach 5. Or no, it's it's if it's not above Mach 3, which is like supersonic yeah, area, yeah. I'm not getting out of bed. And if it's not above Mach 5, I'm not even making my coffee. <laughs> <So it's, laughs> Let's go fly here. Okay. Try your helmet yeah. on. <laughs> That's <I don't> great. <laughs> That's good. All righty. <laughs> Sorry, I hope that wasn't too wordy. No, not at all. Okay, uh, this goes back. Yeah, it's yeah. done in the back. All righty. All right, how's it feel? Loose? 
Uh, it's pretty good. I can't hear much though, so you might have not to... supposed to be able to hear. Either. Okay, good. You'll be, we'll plug it in. You'll be able to hear. All Sweet. right. So I won't make you sit through the whole talk, but we do. We'll talk about a couple things that we're gonna go because I want to get a feel for what you want to do. And so you can pull the helmet off. Oh, it okay. fits. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we'll sit this down here. So the plane we're gonna fly. This is not the color one we have. Is gonna be red and white, but mm -hmm. it's the L thirty nine Albatross. What we'll be able to do today, uh, uh, we'll be able to do some aerobatics. And I know you've learned about G-forces and all the things, but today you're going to go, ahead, go out and experience them. Um, and then we'll do whatever whatever else you want. So the first thing we're going to do is going to take off and we'll fly down down the coast looking at the Outer Banks in a probably perspective you probably hadn't had before. Cool. You've been to Outer Banks before? I have, but only on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> have you been to First Flight? No, no, I haven't. So I didn't first mean Flight go. is where it all began. Yeah, yeah. You know, where it all began. So we're going to go down in the L-39. Oh. Um, to first flight, and then we're going to go overhead first flight, and I'm going to rock up. So bring your phone. Oh rock goodness. up on the wing. The airport's going to be down here. Uh -huh. you got to get a selfie with the airport in the background <laughs> That'll be awesome. from the jet. Okay? Okay, yeah. And then on the way back, if you're feeling good, because mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit warm out there, if you're feeling good, we'll do oh. some aerobatics. So a uh, couple things we can do. Let me know if you know the names of these. So we can do a loop. You've heard mm -hmm. a loop before. It's just basically real easy. We just come up and go yeah. over. To be able to do a loop, though, we got to pull. be able to pull three and a half – to four G's. Mm. And before we even try one, we're going to give you, we'll do a maneuver called the G warm. So okay. I'll give you a chance to turn and I'll actually let you fly the plane. Oh, no do you want to fly it? No way. Absolutely. All right. You got to do it. <laughs> oh yeah. And yeah. I want you to fly one of the aerobatic maneuvers too. So there's a loop we'll do that. And then we'll do one called a barrel roll. So mm -hmm. a barrel roll, you just pick the nose up. It's big. It's only a two G maneuver, but we'll just move okay, and tend awesome. to go like that. Yeah. And then the last one, and I, I saved this for last. Mm -hmm. And this is the one you can fly because it's easy, but it, if people are going to get sick, I don't expect you're going to get sick, but if people get sick, this would be the one that's going to happen. Mm. It's called a aileron roll. The uh, flight controls out here on the wings are ailerons. That's, how, that's what we use. So you take the stick. You're going to pick the nose up to about 10 degrees up. You're going to take the stick and you're going to pick a leg and you're going to lay the stick over in the leg. But you're going to do it aggressively. Mm. Okay. Don't. Don't ease it over. You just yank it. Just okay. yank it. <laughs> yeah. And the plane is going to okay. <clears throat> it's going to snap <gasps> roll like that. And you're going to hold it there. So – you got to hold it. Yeah. Once you get up here, don't look. I've had people go, ah, they stop. So and now happens? we're upside down. No, oh, you, you keep flying. Just shh, The nose will eventually come down. Yeah. But we pick this nose up 10 degrees so that when we roll, because you're going to lose lift, you're going to take your lift vector and point it down. You're going right. to land down. Mm. And so, and you'll be straight and level. And uh, we'll do that and let you do that a couple of times. Then we'll come back in and land. Cool. Sounds like fun? That sounds epic. Let's <laughs> do <so> it. <laughs> you ready to fly? Oh, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Let's get it. My name is Lucia Morin. Um, I've been interning at the NASA Langley Research Center as a high, temp high temperature materials and structures intern. Um, it's been a phenomenal experience. I, I started last summer around June 2023, and now I'm, now I'm here. And I'm concluding actually this Friday. So, And today I'm at the Forgotten Heroes Foundation getting ready to fly a, uh, an L. 39. I, I couldn't feel more lucky. Um, I'm just, I'm surprised that this opportunity even came my way. I feel like I've been rewarded enough <laughs> uh, with my experience so far. So I, you know, just incredibly grateful that you guys took the time to, to walk me through this, teach me a couple fundamentals about flight. You know, this is my first time being in a jet like that. So I just, um, I don't know, I'm blown away and I'm encouraged to get back on the plane again sometime. Um, working on my pilot's license too. So that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> I think it's flat. There you go. There it is. Yep. Pull it tight. Okay. Awesome. You don't have to get in by yourself, but I need you to be able to open the canopy. So you remember how to close it? So we'll bring it over here. So grab that red handle, put it over, and push it forward. Push it forward. Hard, 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 hard. There you go. Okay. Now, if I go, hey, you see, I need you to get out. Go ahead and get out. Reach up, pull it. Pull it back. There you go. Okay. Now reach over with two hands and pick up on the pick up, pick up, pick up. There you go. And I don't awesome. care if we have to get out, just let that canopy go. Okay. We, just on like the ground, yeah, yeah. On the ground, we try to be real gentle with it, uh -huh. but if it's an emergency, I need you to get oh, out. I see. Just get out. Sure. Uh, beans, I'm going to bring it down. Okay.
So do I have to turn on a mic? Um, no, you won't. It'll come up in a second. Oh, sounds good. Where's the farthest you've flown? Say again? Where's the farthest, do you know the farthest distance you've flown? Uh, I mean, I've flown overseas before. Mm -hmm. I've gone from here to Scotland. Wow. And it was for the Navy or on your own? Uh, it's with the Navy. Awesome. Yeah, you got me, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let me turn it down. Awesome. All right. You got me? We're good. All things being equal, we're going to take off, go out to the Outer Banks like I talked about, and uh, have a good time. You ready to go? Awesome. I'm ready. All right. Half the roads, Unicom. Extreme Ridge at 5 Fort Romeo Charlie, Department of Romeo 28, Department of Patterson, Southwest, Sam Roads. You have fun so far? Dream. Ah. <laughs> uh. This is a dream. Uh, cool. Absolutely. What was the first time you flew? How old were you? I was 10. Wow. But it was with a family friend. He had a plane. He took me up. Oh. I knew I wanted to be a fighter pilot at that point. Here yeah. we go. Power's coming up. Good wipeout. I got good hides. I like it. Let's roll. All right, we got 80 knots at the full board. That's looking good. Here come 95. We're rotating. And now, to pause, I'm going to raise the gear. That means uh, we're climbing away. Okay. Air conditioning should be kicking right about now. So hopefully, it's feeling better. All good back here. All right, cool. And now we'll keep 
accelerate to 180 knots, which you should see 145 in that box on the left on the G5. You see that? It's coming through like 150 or so. Once we yeah. get to 180, we're going to pitch up. All righty. Comes 180. Here we go. Oh. Amber, traffic at Fairmont Jet 5 for Romeo Charlie turn on left crosswind. Uh, runway 28 depart the pattern to the south. Amber, Oh, I love flying. <laughs> this is beautiful. Down one will be departing the pattern to the north final. First flight traffic experiment jet stop over Main Charlie is 3,500 feet, five miles north along the beach, beach side, beach traffic. Final on traffic, TBM 338, Kilo Charlie, 11 miles to the north, inbound for straight at 17 at Pine Island. Cool, we're four miles away. Hey. All right, go ahead and I got the cam. I got the controls. Okay. Start getting your camera out. Oh, cool. And then I'm gonna turn it out this way, and you'll be able to see the monument here in a second. Cool. If you look down just to the right of the nose, you'll see like a looks like a I don't know a big cutout in the trees. Yeah. And then, oh, I see you it. see the monument? Okay, yeah. cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to arc around and I'm going to, actually the sun is over on this side, so we should turn and go do a left-hand turn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rock up on the wing to the left. That way the sun is in the right spot. Yeah. Let me know when you got your camera ready. <laughs> I got it. I got it. All right. Almost. That is awesome. And here we go. First flight traffic experiment at 5 4 Charlie's two miles to the north, 3,500, circling overhead at 3,500, left hand turn. First flight. Wait. Did you get it? Yeah. All right, nice. <laughs> we'll head back to the north and we can start mixing it up now. <laughs> okay, cool. We'll start climbing. So now I'll put my nose at 10 degrees up like this and then we'll just climb up to 11,500 feet or 12,000. No, we'll go to 10,500 feet. Okay. Have you ever um, passed out from, from the G-forces or anything when you're no, I haven't. testing? Okay. But it, the way you keep from doing it is yeah. uh, when I tell you, hey, G's are coming on, you tighten your legs up and you tighten your stomach up to keep the blood from uh, rushing to your feet. Oh, okay. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to climb up, and then I'm going to push the nose over and get some airspeed, get fast, kind of like going downhill. And then I'm going to turn to the left or right, depending on what's clouds or whatever else. And that's going to help us, uh, we'll start experiencing the G's and just kind of warm ourselves up, kind of get used to what it feels like. Okay. And then if you feel good doing those, then we can do the loop. And then after we do a loop, then we can do that barrel roll like I talked about. And then uh, the aileron roll, I'll let you fly that one. Oh, <laughs> sweet. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here we are, 12,500. Uh, we'll start leveling off and speeding up, okay? Okay. Nose is coming down. Once we get to at least 300 knots, I'll turn to the left or right. Okay. Probably go to the right first. And you're going to feel it. And I'll tell you how many we're pulling, but... All right, there's 300 knots. Here we go. All right, how you feel? That's three and a half. There's four Gs. There's four... How you feel on four okay. Gs? Um, I can't. All right. See. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. You're good. So. Ah. <laughs> Starting to go dark. <laughs> oh. All right. We'll ease it. We gotta get the blood back in your head, so you yeah. can see you again now, right? Yeah. All yeah. right. Cool. 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 All right. So we gotta get ahead of that. So you gotta. When I tell you the Gs are coming on, I want you to tighten your legs and go <gasps> and, and growl like okay. that. Okay. 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 We're gonna try it again. We're gonna okay. try to keep the lights from keep the lights on. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Coming to the left. All right, there's two. Uh, there's three. There's four. Uh, how you doing? Okay, I'm lights? okay. Lights? Still got lights? Oh, yeah. All lights. right, see? Yeah. Then that's how you got to do okay. it. You kept the lights on. That's what we call it. Okay. You kept the lights on. That's good. Okay. So now you're able to do four Gs. Wait, two, three. We'll that means that we can do anything we want to do out here. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, was, that was the worst. That time. was the test. Yes. 
Seven. Yeah, but I want you, when I tell you the G's are coming on, I want you to grunt just like that. That helps keep some lights on. Yeah. All right. All right. G's are coming on. Grunt. Grunt, 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 grunt. Keep holding. Who hold that S4? All right. Now, G's are going to start easing in a second. They're going to start easing. Oh, this is easy, crazy. Easy, easy. Easy, crazy. The G's are easing on. Get your breath. Get the lights back on. Here we come again. G's are coming on. These are coming on? Yeah. Oh, we're good. We're good. Oh, look at oh, you. perfect. Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Nice job. How you feel? Good, good. Good that job. That first one was a tough, but then I'm good. Then yeah. I'm good. You had to teach you how to keep the lights on. Yeah. That was a perfect loop. Oh. All right. That's the worst of it. It gets easier from now on. Okay. All okay. Right. So I'm going to turn a little bit. I'm going to let the GPS catch up with us. So the next thing we're going to set up for is the barrel roll. The barrel roll is easy. It's only like a 2G maneuver. You pull like four and a half already. Like right. no problem. All right. So barrel roll. Here we go. Right. Look at to the left. We're going to do it to the left. That way when we're upside down, the sun's in our face and it makes for a good picture. Right. All right. Here we go. Look at left. Look at right. Look above. Here we go. Hi. Uh, easy. Yeah. See? Easy. Yeehaw. Oh, no. in the pattern. You ain't touching. Oh. What might you do? You could not touch everything. <laughs> All right. Ooh. You doing okay? Oh, yeah. Nice. So, it's just, okay. so you're out here pulling G's like a G monster without a G suit. That's what I'm talking about. So, um... Four Gs, above four Gs, normally, most airplanes, uh, you can fly those without a G suit and go up to four Gs. Anything? Okay. All right, so here we go. Halo on roll. This one is called the egg scrambler. So I'm going to talk you. You're going to watch me do it, and I'm going to let you do it, okay? Okay, cool. So this one, remember that? Remember, the, see the flight path marker? Remember that yep. I was talking about? So that's on, like, doggone, I guess, it's on the horizon right now. Uh -huh. So what you're going to do is you're going to pull that flight path marker up to 10. Okay. Pause, and then you got to pick a side. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Nice. You okay? Yeah. No, that was fun. That was fun. I'll do it again. All right. I'm going to let you do it the next time. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go back down a little bit. You just hold it all the way to the left. and then Just push it over there. Try to touch your leg and hold it over there. Yeah. And the plane will just keep rolling. Cool. All right. You got the controls. All right. All right, pick it up. Go ahead, pick it up, 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 pick it up. Oh yeah, that a girl. Okay. You're not scared. No, no, no. That was fun. All right. All right. Well, I think that's all I can show you today. You want to do it again? Yeah. All right, all right. Make we'll the do. nose up. Go ahead and do it. Right. Go. Go, 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 go. Oh. <laughs> 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 <That's> so awesome. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. Yeah. All right. I see our airport. I guess we'll saunter on back. <laughs> oh. And I'm going to jet flapper when we try to turn left face runway to a full stop headphones. Flaps coming to full. All right, three down, flaps full. Left down wing, runway two eight, touch and go. Landing checks are complete. Squeak a little power off. Landing. Yeah, there is traffic. Two six four seven Lima three left cross left two eight have to red. Right. Okay, hold on for a second. I'll help you get out. It was phenomenal. Now.
the one thing I was a little bit worried about was the G's. I um, <laughs> worried that I might, you know, lose the lights for a little bit. And when we did our first roll, um, it, I did go dark for not dark, not entirely, but I, you know, I was starting to close. I'm like, oh, what's going on here? Um, and then, you know, he walked me through it. And he just explained, okay, put pressure down on your on your legs, hold your chest tight, and scream and, and, and growl or whatever it is. So I did that, and then we kept climbing the G's, and it was fine. You know, I I was totally fine after that. So. First time around, a little bit, kind of bit nervous, but I was excited and we pushed past it. So that was awesome. So he gave me the reins and he said, okay, we're going to do this alien roll. He demonstrated it one time. It's where you take the, the stick and you push it all the way to the side and you do a flip and it's, it's pretty quick. Then he said, okay, your turn. All right. We got the controls. All right. All right. Pick it up. Go ahead. Pick it up. 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 Oh, oh yeah. That a girl. <laughs> 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 that was fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we do the flip and it's just not as funny experience over enough. I mean it's um I don't know. It's you're all in. <laughs> this this has been a phenomenal week. Just getting to meet, you know, the next astronaut and coming out here uh with my mentors, um, visit a couple um do a couple industry tours to get to know other people in the industry. That was that's been awesome. Um in general, just kind of touring the historical facilities at Langley, seeing the eight foot high temperature wind tunnel, um, seeing this high bay that I work in um, that was you know, one of the original NACA, the original NACA building before NASA was even a thing. Just kind of walking around and, and touring these spaces has been a dream. I'm, I'm just expecting to, you know, continue to stay engaged and curious. I just, I, I hope that I find myself surrounded by people who are just as engaged, just as eager as I am to keep learning, you know, about space sciences or about STEM engagement, sustainability, whatever it might be, continuing to surround myself with both mentors and, and, and peers and early early career people my age that are just as excited about the work that we're doing. From there, I mean, I, I can't even imagine. I couldn't imagine what this year was going to look like when I started my internship last summer and it turned into this crazy dream. And, you know, I, I'm not going to try and set any expectations for, for when I get to college, but definitely just finding the right people um, that are interested in, in similar things. So when it comes to a lot of this, um, STEM engagement stuff, you know, I want to be in the lab and I want to be doing my, my reading, but I also don't want to miss out on like the community engagement side and, and maybe some of the volunteering and I'm trying to learn new things from different people, pick up new technical skills, um, but keep that volunteer work still kind of in life. So doing product-based learning um, has just totally stuck with me throughout my entire life. I think that giving kids the opportunity to look at a real world problem, maybe dig into the news or, or dig into a, a big piece of history, like some cool story, and then tie that into their own project where they're doing a design type of project where they're getting their hands on something. Maybe they're doing CAD or maybe they're they're building something and they're using the machine shop or they're using like some drills and some tools. Any of those opportunities for kids to to own their own projects um, and to see how, you know, these big abstract concepts, how they, how they can play into that. Uh, it's been a great way, I think, of showing students, you know, where they fit into the, the world of STEM and then getting kids exposed to the tools that the professionals use early is just a great way for them to see themselves in that world. And I think it's really, it's really encouraging and empowering when they have the opportunity to do that uh, before they start their college career and before they're paying for it. I think that's a phenomenal opportunity for kids to, again, like you said, get rewarded for, for getting involved in STEM, um, to see how they fit in, to see what the tools are. So working with those little like Arduino uh, setups and the controllers and everything and getting exposed to the fundamentals of maybe electricity ahead of time. I love that. I mean, I think it'd be awesome if every student could get that at some point in their elementary and their middle school and high school career, just some of these project-based opportunities. Um, one or two classroom experiences where they get to um, learn something like that. I think that that's just, that's perfect. Um, wish that that was more accessible <laughs> around the state, honestly, and that more programs like this were, um, you know, push from with our with our public school systems. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much for coming here as foundation.